After Dalton comes a fellow by the name of J.J. Thompson. J.J. Uh, Thompson lived in the later 1800s and did his work in the later part of the 1800s. J.J. Thompson uh, was a British physicist. You see here the word physicist. He's the first of several physicists we'll mention. Um, again, not because the chemists weren't doing any important work at the time. They really weren't true chemists yet, because in order to be a chemist, we have to understand matter and atoms, and these guys gave us that understanding. So they were sort of the, the precursors to chemists, if you will, or you could say even the first chemists, even if they probably didn't know it at the time. J.J. Thompson, just a bit of trivia about him, worked in a place called the Cavendish Laboratories, uh, which is still a, a place you can you can be accepted to go work and study at the University of Cambridge in Great Britain. Um, a very prestigious place to study then and now. Now we're looking at 1897, so less than 120 years ago, a very current time uh, in history. Although it seems like a long time ago in the world of you know the 20th, 20th century and, and slightly before, this is almost 20th century stuff. Um, not, not long ago over, after all. His, ex his experiment's called the cathode ray tube experiment. Now, I'm not sure how many of you have ever heard of a cathode ray tube before. Um, you probably don't think of that as something that you'd find lying around your house necessarily. Uh, but it is. It's in lots of everyday things, although less and less. Um, it, not too long ago, all TVs were the big boxy TVs, and not, the, not the flat panel ones we see all over now, or these plasma, high def, this and that, LCDs. Back then, all TVs were CRT TVs, cathode ray tube TVs. And the same with computer monitors. They were huge boxy things that I'll show you in class can be e easily manipulated with something as simple as a magnet. Turns out even computer monitors of today are fairly simple things, uh, at least the boxy ones were, that we can still screw around with uh, in person the same way that we uh, see Thompson doing that with his experiment way back when. So on the screen here you see a picture of a cathode ray tube. The tube, of course, is the glass looking thing at the bottom of the screen and the uh, battery that's connected to it, this high voltage box you see labeled in the middle of the screen, is a high powered battery. I'll show you a cathode ray tube in class uh, that shows various things when we get to a, a couple scientists later in our sequence here using very high voltage as well. So battery is connected to two sides of this cathode ray tube and what you notice here on the left side is a plate that's negatively charged. You see it's called the cathode and on the other side a positively charged plate that we call the anode. So the cathode on the left and the anode on the right. The cathode is where the cathode ray comes, uh, comes out of or shoots out from and you see across the middle of the screen here then a green sort of beam of light um, that's shooting across. That's just what Thompson believed it to be, a simple beam of light. This tube is, is as you notice at the bottom of the screen, it's a vacuum tube now what that means is that the air has been pulled out of this tube essentially, so there's really nothing left inside of it. Um, not that it's a glass tube full of air, but it's a glass tube full of nothing. When we, when we make cathode ray tubes, the more modern equivalents of these today, the air is pumped out of them nearly completely. You see here it says gas at very low pressure. That means there's hardly any gas left inside. And that means that across that gap between the two plates here, the cathode on the left and the anode on the right, there isn't air between them, or at least not much. And so the light that we see in green here across the middle on this particular drawing um, has to be that, has to be light, right? Because there's nothing else in there. At least that's what Thompson would have, you know, would have believed. The trick came then with the fact that when, when Thompson messed around with this tube of light in a way that, you know, everyday people might tend to do today, uh, he saw a rather unusual uh, circumstance. What he did was put a magnet uh, next to the tube. And we end up with a picture that looks something like this. You can see this is more of a photograph. And I'll show you in class a similar sort of uh, disturbance we can create with a beam of light using a magnet. You see here the person's holding a magnet near the top of the screen, or the top of the tube rather. And if you look closely here, you can see that the beam of light is being bent, or what we say deflected, toward the top of the tube. The ray, the cathode ray here in green again, is showing up as a, a beam of sort of yellow, palish yellow green light across the middle of the tube. And it's being deflected or bent toward the top of the tube. Now, I don't know about you, but I've never seen a flashlight beam or a beam of light from any other source that you could actually bend. So imagine, if you will, a flashlight that you could hold in your hand and then using a strong magnet in your other hand, you could actually take the flashlight, point it down a dark hallway or something, and then put the magnet near it, and you could curve that beam of light without turning your hand and without moving that flashlight at all. You could bend the beam of light. That's not possible. You can't bend light with a magnet. What does that mean? 
Well, it means that Thompson's cathode ray tube, the light in there, wasn't just light in there after all. And that, that's what became a pretty important uh, discovery then from his experiment. Can't, Thompson knew that the ray was one, not simply light, because we can't bend or turn or deflect a beam of light. That doesn't work. Okay? That's the first thing he understood and, and for sure. He, he did further experiments, and if you look here at the picture that's in the, uh, the bottom uh, right of the screen, you'll notice that I've got labeled now on this picture a positive plate and a negative plate uh, at the bottom and the top of the screen or of, of the tube. I'll back it up to a previous one in a little bit larger version here. You can see here that we have uh, the ray being deflected by a positive plate at the top of, this, of the tube and a negative plate at the bottom, sort of using uh, capacitors on either side of, of, the, uh, of, the, of the tube of gas. And what, what's happening in the picture, as you can see, he's taken the beam, which is coming out of the cathode on the far left of the screen here, or the left of the tube, and shooting that beam then through a, a narrow slit in a, another piece of metal in order to get a slimmer beam or a skinnier little stream of light to come through, or at least what we thought was light, to give us a thinner cathode ray. And as he comes through there with a skinny beam, you can see that thinner beam being bent upward or deflected upward by the plate toward, and this is important, the beam was being deflected or turned toward the positive plate. Now if you recall, um, we always say opposites attract, whether it's in relationships or uh, in whatever you may you might imagine. North and south magnets, for example, or as Paula Abdul made famous in the old song, Opposites Attract. Uh, I think she was speaking a little bit more about the romantic type there. And I'll show you that video in class one of these days in case you've never seen it. So Thompson not only knew that the ray was not simply light because you can't turn it, he also knew because the the beam was bending toward the positive plate, that the beam had to be made up of something that was negative. Opposites attract, and so the positive plate was attracting some negative particle. That green beam, in our example in the pictures, had to be made up of something that was negatively charged, because otherwise it would have gone the other direction. Opposite charges attract, like charges repel. So he believed that the particles were negative, and we knew that the beam could not be made of whole atoms. So in other words, that, that plate, the cathode plate, wasn't simply disintegrating and shooting off little bits of itself as whole atoms, because if you had, we know atoms are neutral. They don't have a charge themselves. Atoms can't be positive or negative. They're neutral in charge. And atoms themselves, if they were shooting across that gap as a green beam, wouldn't be turned by a plate, a positive or negative plate, because they'd be neutral. So something shooting across the space would have to be negative in charge. And that was a big deal, because that means that the atoms in that cathode plate weren't the smallest pieces after all. There was something even smaller within those tiny atoms. That was a huge discovery. And what Thompson came up with then was something called the plum pudding model of the atom. Now, plum pudding is something that's a, a very old idea that wouldn't be very common today. I'm sure most of you have never heard of plum pudding, tasted plum pudding, uh, perhaps out of some nursery rhyme or something you've heard of the idea of plum pudding. It's a very British thing, it is. Plum pudding something you'd see over in Britain, perhaps, and they'd still might talk about it there today. But if this was an experiment done in America, we'd have probably called it the chocolate chip cookie dough model instead. Uh, that would resonate with a lot more people, and certainly more so with you and with me, than does plum pudding. Um, we call it the chocolate chip cookie dough model in the American sense because that's kind of what it represents. You'll hear the plum pudding model because that's the official term, and that's the one Thompson would have come up with, wouldn't he? The plum pudding model, but for us, the chocolate chip cookie model, perhaps a bit better. So the reason this works then, or how we described it, was that atoms, which here you see is a large blue sort of sphere, contain something smaller still, smaller negative particles called, according to Thompson, corpuscles. Now that's a really odd word you probably never heard used with atoms before. Corpuscles were the term that he gave those small negative pieces. Now later on those were re renamed as electrons and that's what we'll call them from now on. Corpuscles is a bit more trivial. Uh, so if you're ever on the uh, million second quiz or something and you have to know that word, hopefully you'll, you'll pull it up in your head. I doubt that'll happen. Um, but 
the electrons he, he believed were removable, or the corpuscles as he called them. Those would be the plums in his plum pudding, or as you see them in the picture here as little yellow uh, circles with negative signs in the middle, those would be the chocolate chips of our chocolate chip cookie dough model. And secondly, he believed those electrons, those negative electrons, we call them, were surrounded by a positive field, a positive sort of pudding, if you will, that sort of made the atom neutral. So to have negative corpuscles or electrons, you'd have to have something positive to kind of cancel them out. And he called that something the pudding that surrounded them. Uh, we would call that the dough. So we have chocolate chips, the negative electrons as chocolate chips, surrounded by a positive dough um, that sort of canceled out the charge and made the whole overall atom neutral. Now, why wouldn't we think of uh, the positive maybe as another piece, maybe as a walnut or some other chunk that's in our atom or in our chocolate chip cookie dough? Why would we think about the positive as a simply a surrounding sort of filling? Why would he have called it the pudding and not another type of plum or something else? Um, because he didn't have any proof in his experiment to make him think that the particles um, of electron particles had a partner particle. There was no reason to think that there was also a positive particle in the atom. He didn't have any proof of that. He wouldn't have tried to guess at that uh, or make it up because he didn't have any reason to believe that there had to be a positive particle too. It turns out maybe that you're thinking ahead, you know that that's coming and that there is in fact a positive particle. So Thompson leaves us with the plum pudding model. And that's a really important stage of our understanding. We'll come back to and continue on with Thompson's uh, successor and one of his students, Ernest Rutherford.